I found this Marathon 2 CD in the Denfield Horde. It's a legit bungee disc, no scratches. Oh, there's my camera. And my Patreon supporters have been clamoring for me to do more Marathon content. No, we haven't. Well, a few have. Let's start at the beginning. The first person shooter, or FPS, called Marathon was Macintosh only and released at the end of 1994. And if Marathon was your first FPS game, you were in for a big surprise. Did you just do anything? I personally first discovered Bungie's Marathon when I tried the Marathon 1 demo. The demo was released November 23rd, 1994, a month before the full game, and coincidentally a couple days after I bought my 6100. Despite having brand new hardware, I was late to the party. I didn't know about Marathon until I found the demo on the tools disc that came with my new zip drive later in 1995. This version 0.0, .0 demo I played had a few bugs. Is there an alien inside this wall? Did you see that? Rewind and play back three quarter speed. I found the Marathon 2 CD in the Denfield Hall. No, just the part when I was shooting the pistol. Okay, freeze it. Alien blood. I'll raise and lower the pillar. Oh, now he's dead on the floor. What the hell? If you let it go into demonstration mode, you may get to see Bungie founder Jason Jones himself playing the first level on the highest difficulty. It's... it's total carnage. Now if you watch closely, Jason gives you a lot of gameplay tips in that fight. Let's rewind and play that back three quarter speed. I found the Marathon Okay, forget it. The demo was eventually bug fixed, updated, and distributed as Marathon 4L. 4L referred to the four levels. Three solo levels plus a network level where you were limited to fighting one other network player instead of seven in the full version. The solo levels were level 0, level 1, and level 9 from Marathon 1. It beautifully shows the player just enough to get them interested, while saving most of the content for the actual game. You only see the pistol and assault rifle with underbarrel grenade launcher. But you have to do some work to get the assault rifle, making it a meaningful and memorable point in the game because you have that sense of progression. But you'll run out of ammo in no time unless you learn to conserve it. The demo's hangar bay is missing the escape pod I arrived in, which would appear in the full version. And also barrels were added as scenery objects. I guess to make the marathon look lived in. And no, these were not exploding barrels that became so popular with other FPS games. If you found your way to that room on the other side of the hangar bay, all you'd find is napalm ammo for no reason. Four classes of fighters and the two classes of compilers are the only enemies you will face. Oh, and you get introduced to the panicky civilians called Bob. They're everywhere! He's everywhere! As the manual says, it is your sworn duty as a security officer to protect Bob. But in this demo, if you know enough not to activate them, you'll save yourself much frustration. Ah crap, here they come. They're everywhere! 
Okay, come on, guys. I need on this elevator. I'm like humanity's only hope. You goof! In this last level, they just dump aliens on you. Okay, I'm out of here. Yeah, you go that way if you want. The demo gives you a hint of the betrayal by rampant AI Durandal, or Durandal as I would say it. He hijacks you from your helper AI Leela for this last level, and has you solve this puzzle before you can progress. Bungie was so proud of the network gameplay that at the end of the demo they advertised a tournament for the January 1995 Macworld. The demo was so good I quickly bought the game. The box was a triangular shape which made it stand out from the rest of the software in the store's Macintosh section. You couldn't miss it. And performance on 1994 Mac hardware? I recall even with my 6160AV I put the screen size down to 75% for smooth frame rate. But what about an 040 machine, say the PowerBook 540C? It works. The 540C can only do 8-bit color, and you have to play at 50% screen size or settle for low-res mode. It was the dawn of PowerPC, so Bungie designed it for this next-generation processor, but was motivated to give any 68K color Mac a chance at playing by fine-tuning the adjustable settings even playable on a Mac 2. So Marathon was a pretty demanding game for the time, and an FPS supporting 16-bit color was unheard of. So they were definitely pushing the envelope. I played purely with the keyboard, and the original Apple Extended Keyboard or Extended Keyboard 2 are among the best keyboards ever made. In fact, Marathon was written and tested with Extended Keyboard 2s. If you want to play with the worst keyboard ever, Figure out how to connect the IBM PC Junior keyboard. You'll find almost every design mistake here, and even stupider considering that they did it even after Texas Instruments made a similar high profile mistake a few years earlier. When the fighters hit you, it stuns you, knocks you back, and messes up your aim. The loss of control is scary. So if you're playing with the PC Junior keyboard, prepare to get really scared. These Chicla keys are too tiny, and this diamond layout does not work for me. And why are page up and down the left and right arrow keys anyway? And you need a modifier key to use those functions. They're everywhere! Ah! In the full game, the bobs are back. <laughs> Except some are alien simulations of humans that run up to you and explode. Thank God it's you! That's more creative than exploding barrels. Thank God it's you! Ah! Dude! Once I had played through Marathon, I was looking for more, so I got myself onto this network map featuring hard aliens spawning in all the time, and me without any health recharge, just to see how long I could last. The alien troopers who fire grenades are not to be trifled with. And Marathon let you save films of your game, so actually this is me playing back in the mid-90s. Marathon's success gave rise to two sequels, one each year. Marathon 2 gameplay was much more fun, but not quite as original and atmospheric as the first, in my opinion. Alex Seropian said they dropped the music when they made Marathon 2 because the environmental sounds would better add to the realism than music. The trilogy capped off with Marathon Infinity, where Bungie made available their map-making tools. I'd gone from playing a demo to designing a map, that is just one reason Marathon was a standout series. And when Marathon Infinity announced a contest, it was a great opportunity to try my hand at a map. I put my completed map file on an AOL trial floppy, and then sent it off just before the January 31st, 1997 deadline. Now there was no easy way to find out how I did in the contest, because I didn't have internet or email yet. Laggard. So I ordered what was called the Marathon Trilogy box set, released in 1997. I bought it because it was advertised to include the contest maps. 
It was $50 direct from Bungie, but by the time I had gotten around to buying it in the spring of 98, it was down to $40. The cool box and the fact that they had removed the serial number copy protection from the games helped me rationalize the otherwise redundant purchase. If you look into the trilogy version of Marathon 1 with ResEdit, Jason Jones left a text message behind when he removed the serial number requirement. He should have added it as an easter egg in the game, as it was effectively his farewell message to the series. But I guess they did that at the end of Marathon 2, since he and Alex didn't directly work on Marathon Infinity. They also hid this home video in the box set from way back when they were working on Marathon 1. The submitted contest maps are on the bonus white disc. Okay, let's see if I made the cut. I obviously didn't win or place in any runner-up or they would have notified me by mail. Honorable mention? No. Then there's the best of the rest, aka losers. A folder of 160 submitted contest maps. There I am. Damn! Alongside titles like Crinfinity and For Marathon Map Contest. Actually, For Marathon Map Contest is not bad. These maps were the tip of the iceberg though. The disc came with 1,200 maps total, so if you want me to autograph your map collection CD-ROM, just ship it on over and I'll get you fixed up. What? Well, this isn't a map collection disc. Releasing this and the Action Sack collection were critical to Bungie surviving the lean years of the late 90s, up until their deal with Microsoft. Marathon video docs and campaign playthroughs have been done to death on YouTube, so I won't waste our time doing more of that. And most video docs are made for viewers who have never heard of the game, so not much there for us fans. Yeah, we know that already. And they're still at it. These were just released in the past year. My favorite video doc on Marathon is a well-researched series of four videos by the Examined Life of Gaming, who explains the awesome storyline and even checks in on the rarity of the original boxed copies. But if you want a solid copy of the Mac versions, it might be cheaper to invest in time travel technology than to buy one in box. Probably the most coveted is the Marathon Trilogy box set. Is it worth it? Not for the asking price, no. If you come across one in the wild for a good price, snag it. But we both know that's not happening. Oh, so in other words, hardly anyone bought it. So much for getting my map out there. So for this video, I decided instead of rehashing the Marathon games, I'll focus on my map because at least I know it's guaranteed unique content. What, what is this? Hey everybody, welcome to week 96 of All Things Marathon. I'm your host, Ron. Hey, let's take a few minutes this week to talk about the definitive map collection, which was included with the Marathon Trilogy box set. Specifically, the maps labeled Best of the Rest. You know, nothing you'd actually play at a LAN party, but uh, we're just included with the collection so nobody's feelings were hurt. We're going to take these maps, completely rip them apart, we're going to strip them down to their bare essentials, revealing every secret, and hopefully, by the end, completely deplete your enthusiasm for this game series. Let's start with this week's map, Farchie's Revenge. Damn! So much for that. Fortunately, the Marathon Archive has adopted the contest maps, as well as Macintosh Garden hosting the trilogy box set. So my map was ultimately saved from oblivion by the internet. The Marathon Archive actually spoke highly of my map, take that Bungie, and was somewhat critical of Crinfinity. If you want to solve my map yourself, just take the map, put it in your Marathon Infinity folder, pick it in the drop down in the preferences screen, and enjoy. It was really cool building my own environment, designing puzzles and battles while adding some fun changes to the physics. No wait. Before I continue with the Denfield Horde, there's one point I want to make. Marathon definitely doesn't get the historical credit it deserves. Several videos on the supposed history of FPS games seem oblivious to it. Is it because it was a Macintosh game? So why did Bungie choose the Mac? Well, founder Jason Jones said, quote, The PC market was really cutthroat, but the Mac market was all friendly and lame. So it was easier to compete. In other words, by making an FPS for the Mac market, they could get a much bigger piece of a smaller pie, and in so doing, give them a significant level of notoriety in Macintosh circles. So I watched this video, no, not that video, this video by the Act Man. 
the video was quick to give the credit to 1993's Doom and 1998's Half-Life as the main influences for Bungie's famous Halo. Which is ridiculous considering Bungie had developed their own FPS games before Half-Life or Doom. Halo was not even originally planned to be an FPS, as seen in the 1999 Macworld keynote, but during development evolved into a reimagining of Marathon. Looking good, Bob. Come on, we've got to get the hell out of here. Positions Alpha through Sierra. Center show in this way. But now taking advantage of the huge leap in graphics performance over the five years since Marathon. Typical. I'd like to challenge his information, but a million subscriber YouTuber cannot hope to answer the volume of comments they get, so I won't bother. At most I'll just get dismissive responses from fans who believe everything he says. So you're saying two of the biggest, most influential FPS games ever made had zero effect whatsoever on Bungie? Sure. Traitor. And that's not what I'm saying, so I'll just argue it on my channel. Here's some examples of what I'm talking about. It must have been a trip for gamers back then to see, for the first time, other humans that weren't actively trying to murder you. Yes, except the Bobs in Marathon, four years earlier. But Valve did something incredibly risky and unusual. They attempted to merge three styles of games into one. I can't think of many shooters that emphasize puzzle solving and platforming as much as the combat itself. But most don't even try. I did that in 1997 with my map. Never mind Half-Way from 98. Hey, stop associating him with my map. But it was only a matter of time before someone came along and said, let's write some context for why you're shooting aliens. And that someone was Bungie. In fact, Marathon games even featured multiple factions. and also shifting loyalties, which would only make sense in the context of a well-constructed story. One thing I wish shooters did way more of is give weapons a second function. Just play Marathon. Look, Doom and Half-Life were fun, popular games in the FPS genre, but these fan videos want us to believe they were the only games that mattered. The only ones that had an original idea. If Wolfenstein 3D and Doom was the shooter genre understanding how to use fire, then Half-Life was the genre learning how to harness electricity. So yes, Gabe Newell is the Benjamin Franklin of first-person shooters. Wrong! <laughs> Seeing as id and Valve did not invent the FPS genre, nor did they create Halo, being influential as all these fan-made videos have to lean on. And good luck measuring or approving influence. I guess they want their favorite games to fit this romanticized narrative, but the real story is not that simple. He does acknowledge Marathon exists, but only in this bizarre graphic. So Doom begat Marathon, and Marathon is not even connected to Halo. The reality? Marathon was a follow-up to their own Pathways into Darkness made before Doom. Pathways was a well-received Macintosh FPS, a very challenging game and deep on story. But their next game, Marathon, was starting out pretty similar and unspectacular. Lukewarm feedback from previews motivated them to revamp the Marathon engine. So they killed it. The only things that survived being some sound effects and the ubiquitous caution tape. This is what I think of the Computer Game Developers Conference. <laughs> Gee, that's kind of harsh. Of course, I want to go next year. <laughs> but unlike Half-Life, Bungie built Marathon from scratch. The young Bungie programmer spent every waking hour in 1994 working on the game. I, I have no idea what that means. Every other virtual equals 61? What is that, Alan? Apparently Jason Jones even offered a preview of id Software's newly announced game Quake, a full two years before its release. This should be interesting. Have you heard about Quake? <laughs> Yeah, I've got Quake in here somewhere. Let me see. There you go. <laughs> okay, that's not what I thought it was. In the end, Marathon leapfrogged Doom by giving us FPS staples like dual wielding weapons. Crap. Clip reload animations. Enemies that make a recognizable sound when they see you. That way it doesn't feel unfair when they attack. Mm. 
though sometimes Bungie could not resist a good old-fashioned ambush. Marathon set a mood using dynamic lighting, along with the sometimes somber soundtrack by Alex Seropian. And unlike Doom, you could actually look up and down in Marathon, making it more realistic and challenging. This opened up the world of shooters in many ways. For example, the grenades are affected by gravity, so you had to aim higher to hit more distant targets. Or you could point the weapon to the ground and grenade jump to inaccessible areas. To help with this, Bungie pioneered the mouse as an FPS control option for looking around and shooting. So not exactly a Doom clone, was it? After Marathon, I went to Unreal, and then Halo. So here's a fun exercise. I'll argue that Unreal was the influence for Halo. Conveniently, Unreal is completely missing from that tree graphic, even though Unreal was released before Half-Life and considered superior by many who actually played both games. Little did Valve know this simple addition of a non-combat area and scripted sequences that happen in real time would become the new norm in video games and set the foundation for the next 20 years worth of shooters. The unfortunate thing is, I never finished Unreal because I played an OS 9 and there was some game freezing compatibility issue toward the end of the campaign that I never resolved. I mean, still way better than Half Life, which is one of the few big games that refused to make a Mac port. Well, not until 2013. Little late, aren't we? Maybe it was because the founders of Valve came straight out of Microsoft and there was some platform bias in play. Like Marathon, Unreal pushed the limits of graphics at the time, and if you wanted to play it in full quality graphics back then, you are going to need some serious hardware. Dark and atmospheric Unreal music by Straylight Productions was fantastic and expertly woven into the gameplay as you'll hear. Plot-wise, Unreal had the peaceful and sympathetic Nali NPCs who had been enslaved by these invaders of their world. Help them and they will lead you to hidden items. Or not. The brutal enemy was the Scar. The Scar warriors are very fast and aggressive. But once injured, they become defensive and can dodge your attacks. Pretty impressive AI, not unlike the elites in Halo. Okay, that's not a good example. Other Scar generate an energy shield, just like the Jackals in Halo. Except you can bounce these guys around the map like a soccer ball, which is fun.
Unreal had cool and frightening scripted sequences that happen in real time. Like this first battle with the scar where the music fades away, exits are blocked, and the lights go out one by one, leaving you in total darkness. Another cool area. This gun that shoots Teridium shards I always thought may have been the influence for Halo's Needler gun. You can even wield a severed hand of a grunt with infinite ammo that shoots homing needles. Where have I heard that before? Well, we're both wrong because the needles explode in Halo. Unfortunately. Now, can Ackman or myself show concrete evidence that Bungie lifted those game ideas to incorporate into Halo? That's what I thought! Don't forget the most amazing thing Halo brought was vehicles that you could drive or even fly. Drivable vehicles were not even a thing in Half-Life or Unreal. Now I don't feel bad that I didn't finish the game because Half-Life and Unreal had one thing in common. Underwhelming endings. Rather an anti-climax after what you've just survived. And that was something Halo got right. We have a wildcat destabilization of the ship's fusion core. The engines must have sustained more damage than we thought. Analyzing. We have six minutes before the fusion drive detonates. We need to evac now. Activating final countdown timer. That's the ship! Move! We need to get aboard now! Something like that anyway. Here's a better chart showing the significant FPS games of that decade, including the true Halo lineage. But even this doesn't consider that there were FPS games before Doom or even Wolfenstein 3D. In reality, the FPS came from the original concept in 1974 called Maze War. Hook up two terminals, load up the disc, and it's... Network Deathmatch. Damn! It even had a Macintosh port in the mid-80s. FPS has just evolved from 1974 on, kind of like Unix did. Built on each other's ideas in a competitive environment, ultimately the companies with the most creativity, talent, and passion pushed the FPS genre further. New games took advantage of more and more powerful graphics technology, and in turn created demand for more and more powerful graphics hardware. Decades later, the reputation and perceived influence of these two games has become overblown. It's a pivotal moment in the evolution of gaming, and something that deserves every bit of respect and recognition it gets. Wrong. None of these franchises would be where they are without Half-Life. He's making it up as he goes and not. No, I'm not! Hey, this is getting out of control. In reality, Bungie brought a lot to the FPS table early on, and you can't minimize their accomplishment of creating Halo by handing the credit to another game developer. Actman recently made a great point about the game Elden Ring and its founders, which perfectly parallels Halo and Bungie. So I'm going to borrow it. It's a combination of every good idea they've ever had before, built under the supervision of its original brainchild. If you have a winning formula, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. Just keep rolling, baby. 16-bit low res looks pretty cool. Yeah, it does, it does. The low res is just, is dog slow uh, right now. Though. Jason Jones put everything he had into Marathon and Halo to the detriment of his own health and well-being. But never mind him, we need to thank this dude for Halo. If you ever wondered why the Halo games became much less fun when Bungie left, it was the loss of that high level of artistry, humor, dedication, and obsession. 
I think I think the coolest thing about uh, about Bungie, though, one of our best traditions. I've said this before; people recognize it. Is that everybody here really cares about what they're doing, and, and it's important to them. They they do it well, and it's what makes them happy. Where are you going, boy? You ain't going nowhere. I like Hackman's stuff, but he needs to step back and look at the big picture, not commentate through the narrow lens of his own experiences. I do kind of wish they would, uh, you know, fly around more. Oh, oh, look at this guy. What's up, dude? Oh, well, that's the end of that. Hey, what up, boys? I watch his videos because he presents the new Millennium's games in an entertaining way, especially Halo. Maybe do more of that and just avoid the 90s. There's much wisdom in an old phrase which goes as follows. Stay in your own backyard. To which it might be added, and if possible, assist others to stay in theirs. Via, of course, the Twilight Zone. In this era of mass nostalgia, emotional attachments get magnified. I gotta play Doom! So it's hard to be objective and see that maybe all these games contributed something to the evolution of the genre. And none should be singled out as responsible for it. Doom! Not mentioning Marathon on Unreal in that video kind of hurts his credibility. Try telling that to his fans, though. You've got to think for yourself! You're all individuals! Yes! Okay, that's enough about Marathon. I covered this pretty well, didn't I? No, you did not. If you want to play the Marathon Trilogy on your modern day computer, right now, in its original form, no setup, try this online System 7 or Mac OS 8 emulator called Infinite Mac, which came out during the 2022 Marchintosh. Both emulators are set up with the Marathon games. Maybe it will even import and play my Infinity Map. I'll have to ask Ron. Next in the Denfield Horde, the Apple Geoport Adapter. It was originally shipped as an add-on for the AV Centris and Quadras, and later sold for PowerPC Macs up until the G3. I struggled and failed finding one of these for my 8100 video, and then just happened to find the perfect one in the Horde. This is a nice specimen showing off Apple's contoured design and platinum color. The adapter hasn't yellowed much at all really, seeing as the wall color of my office is matched to Apple's platinum gray. A nice looking wall color, I'd, I'd recommend it. What? Hordes like Denfields are really rare and something that was cool to witness. It shows that there's always something new and interesting to discover, but finding a specific Apple collectible you're looking for requires patience, social networking, and most of all, vigilance.
Why well, I, I saw this place when it was still in town. Yeah. I went. I don't think I want to buy it. <laughs> when you were looking. <laughs> hmm. I'll get a place built or this one. <laughs> like we didn't enjoy breaking into old houses and destroying things when we were kids. Okay. It's in such good shape. I know you're astonished. Actually, the floor is pretty good. No, I mean, I know you're impressed with the beautiful, you know, the lovely yeah. ceiling and the peeling strawberry wallpaper. <laughs> you know. Hey, have you wallpapered your room already? Or? Yeah, I feel up out of it. Yes. <laughs> There's a beautiful washroom, just in case you have to go. Wow. Pretty nice. Yeah, Plus, So, I like the lean on that toilet. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're reading and all of a sudden, oh! It's like being in a motorhome, it's like... <laughs> While well, it's moving. It's, it's, so here you have the lovely oh, bedrooms. It smells like somebody took a leak in here. Like 50 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> Just like this. Yeah. 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 Yeah.